Okay, welcome to your week five lecture on plumbing fixtures. Now there are many aspects of bathroom design that are controlled by ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. The ADA does not apply to private residences, but many designers do consider these guidelines for the future needs of their clients. Many apartment communities will design units for easy modification, like as you can see in this photo, placing extra blocking, these boards here, inside the walls so that grab bars can be installed down the road. It is the responsibility of the interior designer or the architect to select plumbing fixtures and then provide the specifications and rough in information to the engineer or the contractor. Now, generally it, for a residential application, you will be selecting those things. Maybe for more commercial applications or more industrial applications, the architect may. Uh, that's something you do need to clarify with your client and the architect during or at the time of the project. The technical word for toilet is water closet. It's notated on plans as WC. The toilets that we're, we're familiar with have emerged around 1940 and initially held about five gallons of water. So when you press the lever here to flush, this flapper, this thing that covers this hole down here on the toilet, releases the water and it cleans the bowl. So it took about five gallons of water to you know, clean this bowl from all the stuff that was put in there. That's why there's so much water used in toilets. Toilets could have a uh, round bowl or an elongated bowl. Generally, elongated bowls will uh, extend up to 31 inches from the wall, while round toilets will extend about 28 inches from, from the wall. Here are some standard ADA dimensions. These are some dimensions that you're definitely going to need to become familiar with uh, as a designer, especially because they're on the NCIDQ exam. And this is just showing you, this is in your book, and this is just showing you where grab bars should be installed, and how high toilet seats should be, how high the toilet paper should be, um, how far away from the wall, uh, so on and so forth. So there's actually in your book, there's a plan view as well. But basically this, the grab bar that's on the, the uh, wall side of the toilet can, has to be at least 12 inches from the wall and can be no longer than 42 inches long. The toilet paper here on center needs to, can be a maximum of 19 inches from the ground. The top of the toilet seat in an ADA situation should be about 18 inches. For a regular standard toilet, you're looking at about 15 inches. Now here you can see the toilets from the past used about five gallons. Now we have these great high efficiency toilets and as an interior designer you can encourage conservation and water savings through the fixtures that you select. Here's an example of a dual flush toilet from Kohler. This dual flush device that's located at the top of the toilet is used when you want to go number one or you want to go number two. So this releases a smaller amount of water and this releases a larger amount of water. These are pretty common in, in Europe currently. Now a urinal will take up less space than a water closet, about 18 inches of width, and can be substituted for one or more toilets required by code. One typically, however, must comply with ADA and be hung lower than the standard. Lavatories are often called sinks, but they're essentially bowls for collecting water in a bathroom. For sanitary purposes, the sink should be made of hard, smooth surface that's scrubbable, like uh, porcelain, stainless steel, and um, any resin-based solid surface or glass. Other materials could be vitreous china, steel, cast iron, marble, fiberglass, acrylic, anything that's not going to be affected by water and uh, grow bacteria. Now there are several laboratory types. The most common is the drop-in you see here. And basically what that means is there's a, a hole placed in the counter and the sink is just dropped right in there. And it, uh, it allows, the, the sink itself creates this, this rim. Another type is the pedestal sink, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. And then also the vessel sink, and this comes in a variety of different shapes. Even the, the sinks that you see that, that are you know, barely a, a bowl at all, those sometimes can be considered vessel sinks as well. 
So here are your typical lavatory faucets. The 4-inch center set model installs on the top of the lavatory fixture with um, mounting bolts that are passing through the holes that are set here at 4 inches apart. Most lavatory faucets are also furnished with this sort of pop-up drain assembly. The widespread, or also called spread or spread centers, uh, is a concealed design which has considerable popularity across the country. Manufacturers typically offer this in a two-handle version, and it's popular because of its decorative look, and they can be installed with the handles positioned at wider inter intervals than this one will allow. This is also commonly furnished with this pop-up drain assembly. Now, rather than mounting the faucet on the sink deck or the counter, the wall mount then installs directly into the backsplash or the wall. Now, this isn't true for all public restrooms because this is a, a more recent requirement, but they should have self-closing faucets and aerators inside to conserve water and energy. The maximum flow rate should be about 1.9 liters per minute. If you ever go into a public bathroom and you're forced to turn the faucet off, it should feel a little bit awkward to you because that's not very common anymore. Today, almost all restrooms are required to have these self-closing faucets. Now the term sink is reserved for utility sinks, so the kitchen, the laundry room, any sort of service station, and are also often made of vitreous china, uh, cast iron, enameled steel. There are building codes that require the placement of sinks in certain areas, as well as ADA codes for access. And again, mostly that applies to commercial applications. Now there are various types of sinks. This one is an undermount, so you can see that the sink is actually installed underneath the counter. This is really nice because it allows you to wipe things directly into the sink, and you don't have this, you know, lip or this edge to catch, you know, bacteria and things around around the um, around this edge of the sink. It's it can be a more contemporary design, or it can be used in traditional applications. This is the self-rimming or drop-in sink, and here you can see the sink was literally dropped into the counter, and it creates its own rim. This is less expensive than the undermount sink. Um, but also does give you a place to, you know, food and things could get caught. Then there's the farmhouse or apron front sink, and this can be used in a contemporary application or in a more traditional application. And then finally we have solid surface sinks. This is when you specify like a Corian material or something for the countertop and the sink is actually molded from the same material. So this is essentially one solid piece. Now there are three important types of sink faucets to become familiar with. We have the 8 inch deck models which were like the, the, the faucets that we saw for the bathroom except they're a little bit longer. There's also the center mount, and this is really my favorite because it's so clean looking. And what's great is it only requires one hole be drilled into the countertop here. And then finally there's the concealed. And this was fairly common in the past, but I think it's been more usurped by the center mount option. But here, just like with the bathroom, it's technically a, a deck model, these, these various features may be connected underneath, but they're installed below the counter, so there's no plate up here. Now, bathtubs have evolved considerably in terms of makeup and design during recent years. Most new options in this category involve fiberglass and vacuum formed acrylic. And while it may seem like there are a ton of options and models to contend with, most fall into one of if, you know, a few basic categories based on installation. So here's a corner style tub where you've got two sides of the tub that fit into the corner and then some sort of apron or, or front deck is required here to cover this front portion that's exposed. This would be a prefabricated piece that's then dropped into sort of a custom designed uh, deck. Then sunken tubs where the tub is literally sunk in the floor. This you can see is a self-rimming model. 
built-in designs here. So we've got prefabricated tub shells that are, again, installed or dropped into a custom designed or built-in deck. And then this is um, actually a bathroom that I designed in Scottsdale. And here you can see that we have this sort of custom deck that's created. The, the front has been designed to match the cabinetry. And the wall's been tiled with a, a really great limestone corduroy, corduroy tile. And the tub has really nice clean edges. But, it, you know, the tub itself was specified, prefabricated, and then dropped into this sort of custom outfit. Some clients may not want to go through the expense of ripping out the old tub, so they do have tub refinishing options. This can also be called reglazing or resurfacing, and is essentially a process in which a coating is applied over a surface like enamel, porcelain, or fiberglass. Application of porcelain is a process in which glass is fused onto metal at high temperatures, and this cannot be done in your home. So some companies will use an acrylic urethane top coat. The process is basically started by removing the old caulking from around the tub, so anything that's been you know used here to seal the edges, and then thoroughly cleaning the surface. Surfaces that have been painted or glazed before will have to chemically and mechanically be stripped. Then after the tub is clean and dry and all the cracks and chips are repaired, the surface is then coated. Shower heads come in two types. You have the regular stationary shower head, which we're all familiar with, and then the detachable handheld shower heads. These are more expensive, but much more versatile, and they're required in ADA situations so that someone sitting on a, a bench or a chair can, can bathe. And this is actually a pretty standard fixture in Europe. I actually, in my, in my bathroom in Greece, in my first place before I knew Dimitri, this is what we had and there was no hook on the wall so I actually had to hold it the entire time I took a shower. Now here's an example of a roll-in shower. There are two types of ADA showers. One is a roll-in here where you can see that there's no transition strip or there's no height here to roll into the shower and then the shower will kind of lean down towards this drain. This is a really cool uh, wheelchair that's been fixed so that someone can take a shower in it and I imagine they just transfer from their regular chair into this one. The other type is what's called a transfer shower and so here you can see she can wheel her chair around and then just slide over and sit on this bench and she's got the handheld shower uh, head so that she can she can bathe herself. Now showers come uh, in custom design versions or prefabricated versions like tubs. And how a prefab shower is constructed is it could just be a pan where the contractor will purchase a prefab shower pan that you, that you perhaps selected and then build the wall around it and tile up the sides. They also have fiberglass prefab showers that, that contain walls and things. And here's an example of of one. This whole unit here, and this is probably what you're what you're more used to. This whole tub shower unit is a is an example of a prefab design. And this is a pretty decent one, you know, not something you would want to put maybe in a master bathroom, but definitely something that you could put in a guest bathroom. Here's the custom shower next to the the tub I showed you at this home in Scottsdale. So this was completely custom designed. It's a steam shower, so you can see that this glass door has been completely sealed, and a, there was a bench added, and um, not only is there a detachable shower head and two standard shower heads, but there's also a rain shower head above. All right, so in the next video, I'm gonna go over several things I want you to consider when designing a bathroom. But first, I'd like you to study the figures um, figures 8, 17, 8, 18, and 8, 19, and become a little bit familiar with standard bath dimensions, and then you can watch the next video. It's just going to be a few minutes long.